Great. All right, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, I was asked to talk about the state of art in difference imaging and the lessons learned from PanStars, and I feel a little bit like I'm carrying coals from Newcastle because I know a lot of the state of the art work is being done by folks in the audience, and uh, we in PanStars have actually been pretty conservative about choosing an algorithm and uh, sticking with it, that an algorithm that more or less works. Um, I think there's room for improvement on our side, and we're starting now with some inspiration from uh, the folks, the, the new developments, that, to think about ways of improving our difference algorithms. So I'll, I'll talk a bit about how uh, I see this current state of the art um, that's out there in the outside world from uh, other people. Um, so I'm going to start off by hoping my clicker can work. Oh, here we go. Uh, I'm just going to go over a little bit of the how a transient or asteroid detection pipeline works, and a lot of this has been discussed already. We start off with a raw image, and uh, I'll do some detrending to remove the instrumental signature, like Robert talked about yesterday. And then we can zoom in on some patch of that image and uh, pull out some set of pixels. We typically warp the raw pixel system to some consistent grid on the sky, and then we can go and select some reference image that matches that grid, and you can subtract that image from the science image. Now, before I go on, there's some options here that are interesting. One is the reference image doesn't have to be, there, there are options for the reference image. It could be a deep stack from historical observations of that same location, preferably images that are of better image quality than your new image, or it can simply be another exposure taken in the same night. Um, and the exposure, the image that you're subtracting from can be an individual exposure or it can itself be a stack uh, for multiple observations. And in PanStars, we use all three of these concepts. I just lost my screen. Uh, okay, so where was I? I was saying that in PanStars, we use warp-warp differences uh, for detecting asteroids within the night. We use warp-stack differences for supernovae across the three pi, and we also use stack-stack differences uh, within the medium deep field. Okay, so once you've done some matching of the PSFs and subtracting your image, you can then, uh, you've now got an image with only the differences in it. Uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, you now have to go and identify the things in that image that are the garbage. Um, can you advance the slide? Trying. Oh, okay. Ah, great. Okay. Um, so garbage rejection is the next critical step. And if you go to the next slide, once you've rejected the garbage, what's left are exciting objects of some kind. So you have to identify them from your images. Are they supernovae? Are they asteroids? Make some identification of the types of objects. And then you can do a follow-up if you go to the next screen. We usually uh, use CFHT for following up um, faint uh, asteroids or if images of faint supernovae. We use spec for spectroscopy and HST in some cases. So some sort of follow-up resources are needed to really do science on the objects. In this talk, if you go to the next slide, I'll be focusing on the PSF match and subtract step and the garbage rejection. Next slide. Um, and then just go on to the next one. So I'm going to, in the PSF match and subtract uh, realm, I'm going to talk a bit about history. Here's a bunch of the sort of critical references of different algorithms. And um, I'm going to kind of go over a little bit of the, the, the different steps that we've gone through historically um, uh, in the past. So why don't you go to the next slide on that. So the prehistory of this, um, image differencing in the optical really starts with uh, work that was done mostly for variable star and microlensing in the Andromeda galaxy. Um, so the, the three different references that I've got there are working very closely together using similar uh, inherited code, one from the other. The original idea here was that they recognized that you would have some image and some reference image with a presumably better image quality, and that if you convolve the reference image with something, you could match the PSF of the science image. And the early solution here was to use Fourier space, recognizing that the convolution was a multiplication in Fourier space. And so they, they suggested simply solving for that convolution kernel by taking bright PSF stars and then taking the Fourier transform and dividing the Fourier transform of the science, the target image, by the Fourier transform of the reference image for those PSF stars. Now, the problem with Fourier space analysis is that high frequency components usually have low signal to noise. And so the noise in those high frequency modes tends to 
uh, couple back in real space into uh, lots of artifacts. And so they attempted to avoid this by, um, by uh, using a Gaussian fit in Fourier space to that convolution kernel and uh, suppressing the high frequency modes that were noisy. Um, if you go to the next uh, page, um, so the problem with Fourier space analysis is that even though you may try that sort of trick of suppressing high frequency modes, you, you, there ends up being a lot of sensitivity to noise in any case, non-Gaussian outliers and other garbage will cause lots of artifacts that can be hard to deal with. Um, so the seminal work in this field really was when Allard and Lupton came up with the idea of doing optical image subtraction in real space, basically recognizing that you could solve for the kernel if you choose a set of basis functions and simply solve for the coefficients that um, of that basis function that, that make your image, your reference image match the science image. And so Allard and Lupton defined a basis function set that was a, some set of Gaussians of different widths multiplied by polynomials. And this has been quite successful. And part of the advantage of this is that you don't have to have isolated PSF stars. You can actually use most of the stars in the image uh, as references. Um, and it also allows you to vary the, the convolution kernel as a function of um, position in the image to follow variations in the PSF. Um, and Andrew Becker's hot pants implementation of this method is probably the most commonly used version of uh, image differencing out there. A lot of projects will simply adopt hot pants as their uh, software to use. Um, let's go to the next. So one of the problems with the standard Allard and Lupton process is that the basis function doesn't necessarily do a good job of representing um, the convolution between one image and the next. Uh, there's a somewhat exaggerated problem in this image um, from Bramovich uh, to 2008 where the reference image or the science image has been poorly tracked, so you've got the double stars everywhere. Um, but in general, there's also often problems where the convolution kernel built from Gaussians doesn't necessarily represent reality very well. So some people have done tests and experiments trying to use pixelized basis functions. We did some experiments in PANSTARS as well. A couple of the different groups that came out with papers on this are listed here and some of their examples of their results. The idea here is that the kernel is just a set of pixels and so you can solve for the coefficient for each pixel in that kernel independently. Um, that's both an advantage and it also is its own disadvantage. The noise problems that we see in the Fourier transform also uh, work, happens here. We have um, the wings of the PSF have a lot of noise and so the pixels are not, pixel basis function ends up not being very well constrained out there as well. Um, let's go to the next slide. One of the problems with all of the previous algorithms is that they ex assume that the reference image can be convolved to the science image. Um, and in other words, that the reference image is smaller in all dimensions than the science image. Uh, and this isn't always the case in a gen general survey. Um, if you've got one image minus another taken a few tens of minutes apart, they may have slightly different image quality problems that don't necessarily go in the same direction. Um, and so uh, Yuan and Akalov suggested convolving both images with something to come to a single common PSF. And this can address uh, ellipticities that are different in the two different images or rotation. Um, and the obvious problem with this approach is that the, um, the there's a degeneracy with the size of the kernel. You can always have a larger and larger kernel and uh, still get a clean difference image. Um, and so Yuan and Akalov proposed a um, penalty function that I have listed there, where as the size of the kernel grows, your, uh, your, your um, whatever criterion you're using, your chi-square, your likelihood value um, gets penalized by the larger, the larger kernels. Uh, this, this effect works pretty well. Um, it allows the it allows you to be agnostic about which image is the reference and which image is the science image. Uh, and you can still allow kernels, the coefficients to vary as a function of two, di two dimensions in your image. Uh, and PanStars uses a, an implementation that is similar to this, although we play around a little bit with the, with the penalty function. Let's go to the next slide. Um, now all of those 
examples that I showed before, there, on each of those slides, there was a little example from each of the different papers, and they all look beautiful. They all look clean. Um, and in reality, anybody who's done difference image subtraction knows that when it works, it works great, and you get a nice clean difference image. But when it doesn't work, it leaves a lot of stuff behind that probably should have been in the convolution somehow. And um, a lot of the research that's gone on in the past 20 years has been in trying to improve the ways of defining that uh, the kernel so that it doesn't blow up in some of these edge cases. One of the work that I've seen recently in the, all on these lines is this work by Zake et al. in 2016, um, which kind of approached the problem differently. In all these studies, in all these uh, difference image problems, when you generate your difference image, once you've got that image, you now have to detect sources in the image. And so to do that, you need to, it's the match filter problem, you need to convolve with the PSF of the image. Um, Zake et al. said, well, why don't we, instead of trying to solve for a good difference image, why don't we try to solve for the optimal detection image, the optimal significance image, which is the result of that convolution? And so they, they define a problem where both reference and science image are being convolved by some kernel. And it turns out that the optimal detection image can be constructed with just the PSFs of those two images. They then take that optimal detection image and back out what the difference image and the PSF to convolve with that difference image would have been. And this, this uh, thing that I show here is the result of that. Um, basically, and they do this on Fourier space again, much like the old style uh, Tommy and um, work before Allard and Lupton. Basically, they're taking the science image and convolving that with the reference kernel, the reference PSF, and they're subtracting that from the reference image multiplied by the um, science image PSF. Con all of that's done in Fourier space, of course. But then they divide by a um, something which basically is looks like the amplitude of the two PSFs summed together with some uh, relative weightings. And this denominator has the, um, the impact of essentially whitening the noise. It, it suppresses the pixel to pixel correlations across the image that you get uh, in the standard convolution process. This is really advantageous because it means that the image that you get out of this method has um, variants that you can understand on the individual pixels. And um, you can then use standard statistical techniques on that image uh, in order to extract your various measurements, your various parameters. Um, I, I've made an, actually don't go yet, yeah, I've made an implementation of this myself and it, it works pretty well. Um, it is, because it's a Fourier space technique, it is also sensitive to the high frequency noise problem. So features like cosmic rays or poorly masked uh, garbage in the image instrumental artifacts um, feed through as into the Fourier transform and you end up with some structures from those features, but it does seem to generate a quite clean difference image in pretty bad circumstances. I noticed that uh, Robert and Reese and Lupton explore using the same noise whitening technique with the uh, Allard Lupton style uh, representation of the generation of the kernel and, uh, and, and they have some interesting results there as well, getting the noise whitening advantage of this technique. Um, so I think there's definitely some room for uh, good improvements in the algorithm, maybe, maybe making it a bit more robust against uh, some of these bad features that we see and then allowing for some um, agnostic, uh, not needing to know the basis function um, as we currently do with the Allard Lepton style, not needing to fine tune that. Uh, if you go to the next one, the alternative is to simply throw machines at it. Um, this paper was a very interesting one because uh, it um, basically they are saying, well, let's forget about making a difference image at all. What we really care about are the things that we're detecting. So let's just simply train a machine to look at a bunch of images and find things that are difference detections, or sorry, that are transient objects or moving objects in those images um, from a training set. So they throw a huge training set of detections of real, of real supernovae or whatever at the, at the machine, and they end up with some complex convolutional network that, re, that generates detections based on some set of images. I think this is really interesting. It's kind of scary to me as a person who doesn't really do machine learning, but 
Um, maybe this has an advantage in circumstances when the things we're trying to detect are not well represented by PSX. So for example, in asteroidal science, they're often moving and streaked out across the image. Um, that would be something that you could include in the training set and the machine could potentially do a good job of pulling those out where um, typical techniques maybe don't do such a good job of finding those streaks and, and recovering them, especially when they're broken up by structures in the images. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so let's move on now to garbage rejection. And I'm not gonna talk about history here. Instead, I'm just gonna talk about what we're currently doing in PanStars and some of the structures that we see and how we're handling them and some of the implications that might have for LSST. Next slide. So here's a bunch of the different kinds of things that cause uh, false positives in your images, in your difference images. And a lot of these are things we've talked about, um, ghosts and diffraction spikes and nonlinearity and so forth. If you go to the next slide, the next three slides um, are a single warp from PanStars and then follow to the next slide. There's a second warp from a few minutes later, 20 minutes later. This is a typical set of observations that we'll have looking for asteroids. And then we'll make a difference between those images. Next slide. So this is just our standard uh, recipe for the uh, Yuan and Akalov cross convolution style analysis. And you see a bunch of structures in the difference image. And I'll label some of those if you go to the next slide. Um, in the positive image, you can see some example of persistence. That's a place where a bright star earlier in the night deposited a bunch of charge and it's slowly leaking out into the readout portion of the device and we get uh, persistence repeatedly. It's in the next image as well. If you go to the next slide. And you can see that the uh, ghost that's there is also not perfectly aligned in the two images, so it's, it doesn't subtract very well. You can see the diffraction spikes in this image if you go to the next image. Um, the diffraction spikes from two images 20 minutes apart have rotated across our detector while the sky is rotated and we followed it and the, uh, the struts on the telescope have stayed in place. So we see diffraction spikes move in our image. So they don't subtract very well. I've also labeled some cosmic rays. These actually are generally detected and masked in our analysis at the difference image stage. Um, we also have some things that I label as dipoles. These are places where the stars that are bright and the image difference kernel is not perfectly representing the high frequency structure in the core of the star. And so we end up with structure that's left behind. It's not really a dipole, um, but we call them dipoles because often they, most, they stand out most because when things don't align perfectly well. Um, and you can see one thing that I've kind of humorously labeled as a vignetting change. Uh, if you go back one slide, you can see this is a, probably something like a hair that's landed on the detector since we made the flat field and it doesn't flatten out very well. And it's also not in exactly the same alignment. So the two images um, don't subtract well from each other if we go forward again. So we get a little bit of difference from the shadowing of, from that little bit of smudge on our detector. And of course there's real vignetting changes at the edge of the field due to either illumination or motion of the, uh, the baffling system. Um, and there are other things that cause problems, uh, false detections. Variance misestimation is one that comes from the fact that there is correlation of the noise, and we don't do a good job of tracking the covariance. We, we attempt to, but we don't do it completely successfully, and so we get our effective variance wrong for the detections. And that means that when we say we're detecting a five sigma source, we're actually detecting something that's uh, fainter than that, or in some cases brighter than that. We don't actually get that, that cutoff correct. Uh, if you go to the next slide, Here's an example of very bright ghosts. We have ghosts, they have to get masked. We attempt to do that from an empirical model of where the ghosts land, but it's never perfect. If you go to the next slide, I'm gonna focus in a bit on this. This is crosstalk. So on the top, you have a very bright star um, to the right of that right-hand box. That bright star's core is so saturated, um, it's then echoing in that you see the features, I wish I could point at my mouse there. Uh, in each of these cells, you can see a little feature that represents the crosstalk coming from the saturated core of that star. And in the left-hand side, you can also see in the neighboring chip, it's showing up in three of those cells at least. Um, down below on the second row, you see a, another bright star and it's crosstalk 
cross-talking into neighboring cells, and it's also cross-talking into the, the one cell far off on the left. And in the middle, that looks like cross-talk that actually has a negative sense. Um, I'm not sure whether that's because the saturation was so strong that it caused some interesting effect in the ADD converters or what, but the, that is the same crosstalk feature, but it's negative in this image. These are all positive images. These are not difference images. Um, so the thing about crosstalk is that you have a very complex matrix between the cells which are where the bright stars occur and the crosstalk signal in all the other cells. <clears throat> we have a fairly simple set of rules right now, but we know they're insufficient. And we also know that the crosstalk amplitude changes depending on the cell. So we, the, in order to subtract the crosstalk, we would need to get the amplitudes correct for all of the different crosstalk um, channels. We are currently in a campaign to try to, <clears throat> excuse me, place bright stars on every single cell. We have 4,000 cells in our camera and have the, each exposure have a single bright star in one cell that can then be tracked back across all the other cells. Um, that's a very slow process, but we'd like to get a much better map of our um, crosstalk matrix, both in terms of where things trigger and also the amplitude. If you go to the next slide. So what do we do about all this garbage? We kind of have two different pipelines. We have an asteroid science pipeline and a supernova pipeline, um, and they do somewhat different things in some, some common prospect op operations as well. So first, uh, in the asteroid science pipeline, we take some statistics of the things we detect, both in the difference images and in going back into the positive and negative image, the image that was the two images that were subtracted from each other. And we measure things like the, the flux at that location, the second moments, how many mass pixels there are. And, uh, and these statistics may allow us to make some rough cuts. Um, for example, bright star dipoles are easy to reject because you've got a positive star and a negative star, both of which are significant. But if um, if you have something that's only in one of the two images, that's much more likely to be a real difference detection. We make relatively generous, uh, conservative, I should say, cuts here because we don't want to reject any real asteroids. So we allow, we reduce the false positives by maybe 70 to 90%, but that means we let a lot of real thing, of false things through because our true false positive rate is more like 99 or 99.9% .9%, depending on the data. Um, so we really rely heavily on human vetting. Every night, the moving object pipeline matches up detections and makes tracklets. And then humans look at the proposed asteroids <clears throat> and looks at all the apparitions of those in our data and um, decides that some of these are, are real or not based on whether they look like garbage or not. And typically, the, the nightly MOPS moving object pipelines are looks through 20 or 40,000 individual detection images uh, to do the, the garbage rejection. If we go to the next slide, um, we do some similar things for the, for the supernova pipeline. Here I'm talking about the Queens University Belfast team. Um, they take the individual detections from the difference images and they use some similar cuts like the moving object pipeline, but then they also throw the pixels at, from those difference images at a machine learning um, tool. They've actually gone through two different iterations on this. Early on, when they were working on just the medium deep field data, the images were much cleaner, and so they were able to use one relatively aggressive tool and throw out lots of the garbage and not reject too many real things. Um, now they're doing observations on the individual exposures, the warp minus stack uh, observations from across the whole 3 pi, and if they use their old machine learning you know, algorithms, they're, they're too aggressive and they reject too much real stuff. So they've now turned to a, a new convolutional network, <clears throat> which they tune to be somewhat conservative, to, a, to only reject, um, to, to allow a lot of the garbage through because they don't want to cut out some of the real stuff. Um, and then they also throw all the things that are accepted by the machine uh, at, at humans. So they have a citizen science project called Supernova Hunters, and every week, um, thousands of detections go on to the science, to that server, and the humans go and look at those, um, usually within 24 hours of the, of the dump every week. Their time scale is different from the moving object pipeline, so they can uh, allow that process to be a bit slower than the MOPS nightly zarring. I mean, in the end, they combine both the human and the machine learning scores to get a final rejection um, and acceptance score. <clears throat> 
Um, if you go to the next slide, now, I'm actually not going to dwell on this because I'm, I'm running a little bit long on this, but uh, there, this is an interesting paper comparing different image, um, image difference algorithms and different machine learning algorithms on the results of those different images, image algorithms. And my takeaway from this paper was a bit different from the authors. The authors decided that one particular combination was clearly superior, but my takeaway is that it really depends on the circumstance. They're com comparing here um, synthetic data and some real data and what the, uh, the classification does if you don't do any machine learning or you just use basic non-parametric uh, cuts like uh, we've used in the past. Um, uh, and when I look at this, it looks like it really depends on your circumstance, how well the machine learning tools work and the different types of difference image algorithms that are being used. So I think you really need to be prepared to try a lot of different possibilities in your particular case. Um, if we go to the next slide, just a couple more slides about how we're doing and why it's important to do a good job with rejection. Um, this just shows that PanStars is um, discovering lots of the near-Earth asteroids. We're kind of the dominant discoverer most of the time these days. Um, if you go to the next slide, in the supernova world, we're, um, we've traditionally been a major contributor to supernova discoveries. Uh, ZTF is turned on now and is now contributing lots of new discoveries uh, in this past year. Um, if you go to the next page, this is an interesting comparison for last year, 2019. ZTF discovered um, more than half of, the, slightly more than the discoveries of PanStars. And uh, then Atlas came after PanStars. But what's really interesting is the distribution of the magnitudes of the discoveries. So these are the magnitudes of the alerts from PanStars in red and ZTF in green and Atlas in blue um, and some of the other, the two of the other top discoverers of supernovae. Um, well, what's really depressing for PanStars is the next slide, where we show after things have been discovered, they have to get classified with some follow-up uh, spectroscopy. Um, Atlas and ZTF are doing quite well. PanStars is only getting a small fraction of its discoveries classified. And this is because we throw them all out there to the world, just like ZTF and Atlas do. ZTF has a bit of an advantage because they have an integrated machinery locally, which kind of automatically goes after spectroscopy of objects. But we have our team to go after spectroscopy as well. The problem is that we're discovering things in the faint regime below 20, 20th magnitude. Um, and those things are not getting followed up by people in the rest of the world because there's just not enough large glass to follow up all those supernovae. So triaging is really important. We really have to do a great job of triaging our possible candidates for follow-up, but we do that pretty aggressively. Uh, we also are trying to do a better job of follow-up by having the UH 88 inch, um, we're trying to roboticize the UH 88 inch to automatically go after um, more objects here with spectroscopy. Um, but this is a place where uh, having no, having a very pure sample going into the follow-up is critical. So garbage rejection and doing a really great job in the difference imaging is important. It's also a place where LSST is going to be have to be really good about knowing which 22nd and 23rd magnitude objects to go after because many of the, or sorry, Rubin Observatory detections will be to the right on this plot, uh, to the right of where PanStars is making discoveries. And so last slide is just a list of the uh, conclusions and lessons learned. And I think I'll just stop there and take questions. Okay, thank you, Jean, for that um, excellent overview of difference imaging. And a big round of applause on Slack for Jean. Uh, do we have any questions? Colin or John, I have to ask maybe you to help. No, no questions yet. We'll have to stop sharing my screen, I think, to um, no hands up. Do we have any questions through Slack? Use my phone to use Slack now. Just Robert's usual comments and corrections. <laughs> Thanks, Robert. 
So you, you now have hands up from Gary and Rahul. All right, we'll start with Gary. Trying to unmute you. Okay. I mean, thanks. Um, I'm curious, your Panstar has been running a long time now, so the stars have moved. Yeah. Um, have you started to notice that, or do you use templates that are always recent, or how do you deal with that? Yeah, um, well, for the object, sorry, for the asteroid pipeline, we're mostly still using warp warp differences, which means that the differences are just taken within a, within a night. Um, for the supernovae, we, the small amount of motion is probably swamped by the fact that our difference kernels are not great and we end up with uh, dipoles for bright stars anyway. Um, I don't know that they've ever seen this for faint objects causing false positives. Okay, thanks. Raul? So I, I wanted to ask, what about the measurement? Is that entirely on difference images that you've been doing? In terms of, <clears throat> well, it's actually a bit complicated. So we do a detection of the source in the difference image, and then we do a, so we measure the position of the object and we measure our flux in that image. For the, um, the moving object pipeline, they really only care about position to first order. They go back and actually on many objects, they'll go back and re-measure the position on the warps, which is a bit more pristine than on the difference images for things that they think are likely interesting objects. Um, so that uh, reanalysis of the position did, does gets a bit better uh, astrometry for the source. And they also can then fit a trail and just check that the thing is or is not trailed. There's also um, on the supernova side, the supernova team go back and do force photometry on the individual positive images. Uh, and that's the photometry that they use in the light curves. They don't use the difference image photometry for the light curve um, as far as I know, although I could be corrected by people here on this line, I suspect. Okay, a question from Federico. Uh, hi, yes, uh, we're preparing to build the templates with the Urban Observatory, so we've been talking about uh, how different template constructions affect science, and so I wonder if you have any tips on that. For example, um, I deal a lot with variables and transient science and variable and transient science people, and there is a strong um, requirement for taking stacks that have images inside that are somewhat logarithmically spaced to catch different variability scales. Well, <clears throat> we, we, we unfortunately are not able to do too much in terms of different kinds of templates. For the medium deep fields, we have done templates which are off year templates. So um, take all the data from the previous year or the previous seasons and generate a template for the current season. Um, and that's been important for getting rid of backgrounds for supernova, uh, for getting really pristine light curves. Um, for the more general sky, when we have the three pi data, we don't have um, human resources really to do templates very frequently. So we've generated templates um, when we can, and we probably should be generating new templates already for um, the telescopes now, um, but we haven't had a chance to update our templates for a couple of years. But one of the things that's, two, two things are interesting. One is that we are able, um, we have this problem where PanStars has been, PanStars 1 has been improving in image quality kind of monotonically over time. And that means that we had a, have, a, have had a problem where the templates that we generated early on were guaranteed to be poor image quality than the images coming down the pipeline. So we often have this problem where the, the image that we want to difference is the better image against compared to the template. Um, and that's in some sense good. We want to have the telescope getting better, but it does make it a bit challenging to have a generic uh, algorithm where you assume that the template is going to be better. Another thing that's interesting is that for PanStars 2, which is now operating, so we have two telescopes running with sort of the same design and sort of the same cameras, but not exactly in either case. Um, and we are using templates for PanStars 2 that are generated from PanStars 1 imaging. So we have been doing warp minus stack um, on the sky using images generated from PanStars 1 and successfully getting things out of PanStars 2 that way. Thank you. 
Okay, my uh, Have when you uh, based on the classification, two questions. First, both the cases you mentioned, asteroids and supernova, um, you could mask out all the known stars. Uh, so the first question is, do you do that? And the second is, uh, based on the artifacts that you do find through all the hand, hand scanning, have you found classes of artifacts that you can go back and figure out how to algorithmically do better in the difference imaging subtractions? Um, so the answer is basically no to both of those, mostly by lack of resources. Um, but uh, in terms of masking stars, I think the main reason that we block on doing that is that we are scared of masking galaxies by including them in the star sample. So maybe now with Gaia, we should be going back and using things that Gaia tells us are actually moving and knowing that they are stars to mask them, but we haven't done anything like that. We could also imagine going, we don't do a good job at that stage, for example, of using prior information about the sky. And we could, for example, simply use where every source is known to be and construct a model of the, the residual in that image and subtract that, but we, we're not doing that either. Um, and that would help. But our we kind of don't, need to so much because our dipole statistics are rejecting things that are stars based on the presence of the star and the positive and the negative image. What was the other part of your question? So based on all the scanning, hand scanning, oh, yeah. uh, or other things, have you found classes like, oh, here's how we could tweak this parameter, or here's the thing we're not quite getting right in our PSF modeling that feeds into our subtraction algorithm? Only some. We should do a lot better. We have lots and lots and lots of examples of things that are clearly garbage that we could learn from. Um, <clears throat> it's, we've tried to do experiments of tuning based on feedback from what's been rejected of tuning the parameters that helps the, for the sort of cuts based on the, the raw parameters. Um, I, I, I'm hopeful, which we're starting up a project now of throwing the real and false classifications back at a machine learning garbage rejection algorithm in the, on the difference image stuff and also on the positive image stuff, just to have an additional statistic of whether this is possibly real or not, not necessarily relying on that too heavily, but adding it as a, an additional feature that we're, we're using. But that's only just beginning. Maybe we'll get some progress on that by the summertime. Thank you. Okay, um, we'll just take one more question from Robert that he's asked on Slack. Maybe he wants to ask it here. Oh. Just that um, Paul confirms that we don't have an ADC on pan stars. So do you see any problems due to the atmospheric dispersion? I can't say that we've detected or that we are sensitive to it given the other things that are creeping into our difference images. I think that we're so swamped with other kinds of artifacts that the small number of stars that are sufficiently blue or sufficiently different in color from the mean color is, we lose it in the noise. Even in G-band? Um, I can't say that for certain, but I don't think I've seen that as a dominant problem. But one thing I haven't tried is to go back explicitly and say, okay, I know these stars are blue. What do they look like in the difference images? That would be an interesting question. Yeah, I mean, it's something we worry about. And we're going to talk about it, and Garrick may be about to talk about it. But as far as I know, it's not actually causing people trouble in the real world. Now, I don't quite understand why not. Because if you do a back of an envelope calculation, you think it ought to be uh, something to be little messes up. As you say, yeah. it may just be subdominant to other things. Yeah, I, I think that's that's the answer. Is that there's, and 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 may may very well be that LSST, sorry, Ruben, does so much better a job of getting the uh, other kinds of artifacts down, that that's not a problem that, that the dipoles from DCR become significant, but um, it hasn't been dominant for us. Yeah, what's the median pan stars image quality these days? That also makes a difference. About, well, for PS1, it's about one. For PS2, it's about one and a half, 1.3. Yeah, so maybe it's just like slow mo. We wouldn't have seen this because the image quality was sufficiently bad that the ADC is small. Yeah, Possible. Be. Thank you. Okay, so thank you again, Jean, for that talk. Thanks.